Who's the best player you ever played with? With or against? With and against. Well, there's LeBron and Kobe. Those guys, obviously, their their track record speaks for itself. But yeah. it's just you know what they 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 were just they were just good. They're just good physically, mentally. They just knew what to do. They knew how to do it. Like there was no. question that I usually start off with is who are you? Uh, in what sense? Athlete, parent, uh, advisor, like when, coach. Like, <laughs> how do you identify yourself? How do I identify myself? Well, me, I'm a very giving person. On a personal level, I, uh, I like to give back. I like to share my experiences with, um, you know, people so they, could, so they won't make the mistakes I did. Uh, and successes, depending on uh, what what information they want. But uh, I'm just I'm just me. I'm just trying to live day by day. Be a good uh, good father, good family member, good brother, uh, good adversary to this world. That's really about it. And what kind of mistakes did you make that you don't want other people to make? Well, you know, um, given my uh, career, um, not just basketball, academically also. Before I started playing basketball, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I was in a lot of trouble here in Montreal, uh, given the system and, and whatnot. And I didn't have the opportunity to be able to be uh, academically as successful as others because I wasn't really putting myself in a position to do that, right? I was doing, the, you know, I was on the streets and following the wrong people and having the wrong people surround me at a young age. And uh, I learned quick that that was not the way to go. You know, and I had to learn quick. And I got the opportunity to go to Florida, to go to a prep school. And I was able to uh, turn my life around. But given that opportunity, uh, I, I always considered a, a blessing because a lot of student athletes don't get that opportunity. You know, maybe if I can get that opportunity at that young age, I would have stayed here and maybe, you know, not gone in the right direction and done things that I was supposed to do. You know, so uh, with that being said, I turned my life around, went to this prep school, gave me the opportunity to have a goal, which was to play basketball and get my education. And the rest is history. I went to Niagara University, got my degree, uh, played pro for uh, about 10 plus years and yeah, represented the country and yada, yada, yada. But uh, neither here nor there. I mean, there was a lot of bumps going through this process. And I always, I always try to tell these kids growing up, listen, just, try to stick to something that you believe in and, and never give up and just academically stay on school, stay on board with school because that's, that's what's going to get you in life the furthest. And how were you discovered to go to the prep school in Florida? Okay, well, uh, long story short, there was a guy who went to a Division II school at the time in Florida. And his best friend was the assistant coach at... Uh, the uh, prep school and they just contacted each other and they said look there's a kid here in Montreal that has uh, the ability to maybe play at a high level and they just told me listen you need to do this do this and you'll be able to uh, be able to get over there and, and showcase your talent and see where it goes. So were you scared to leave Montreal? Well I was 14 15 years old I was just turning 15 uh, was I scared? Definitely I was. You know, it was a new it was gonna be a new experience. I've never left my family before that. I never got on a plane before that. So wow. everything everything was new. You know, and I was I just had to get up and go because I thought I had to think, well, is this the best is this for the best of interest of my family and myself? Yes. Am I scared? Yes. But in life, you know, sometimes when you're scared that's the best that's the best way to get through things because then after you get over that hump, nothing can really, you know, derail you on what you want to do. And if you didn't go to the prep school, or if you stayed in Montreal, what would you be doing now? What would I be doing? Well, that's, that's, that's something that I've always thought about, but I mean, I do not know. I can't even answer that because I, I know I wasn't, at the time, I wasn't in the right mind frame to be able to be, come out of Montreal and be successful because of the people I was around and what I was doing. But with that being said, um, I got the opportunity that I needed. 
you know, because some, sometimes a lot of student athletes just need an opportunity, you know, but if, if the opportunity does not present itself, then they spiral into that negative lifestyle and, you know, they, they, they cater to the easiest, most accessible tool, which is the streets. And, and sometimes it doesn't turn out well, you know, but I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity, a blessing in disguise to, to go to this prep school and be able to uh, achieve my goals. And why did you choose to play basketball out of all the sports? Well, uh, I used to play football before I played basketball. So I was a big, big football guy. You know, I uh, played football for about a good solid two and a half years. Basketball, I picked up late. Basketball, I picked up at like 13, 14 years old. Um, I just start growing, you know, that growth. Uh, growth uh, I just start growing and uh, I said, look, let me try this out. You know, I already had the physical tools to be able, the, the roughness, the toughness to play, translating from football to basketball. But my skill wasn't there because I, I was a late bloomer. So I decided to just work on the craft. And I thought, okay, well, this is something to look forward to. And I just tried to do the best I can. You know, I made it as far as I could. And did you ever think about quitting when you were uh, in Florida? Quitting? Um, there was, there was uh, not, not, never quit because I, I don't believe in quitting. I believe when you make a decision in life, you know, a lot of times you need to know the pros and cons and just try to outweigh the pros. Uh, that's the way I live and I've always been that way. And I'm a fighter, so... When it comes to that, I, I never, it never crossed my mind once to say, you know what, I give up, I'm going back home. You know, because really, what am I, what am I turning back to? You know, let's, let's be honest here. What am I turning back to? What will be uh, the positive if I do go back? Will I be in a better position or will I be able to uh, achieve what I want to achieve in the path I'm taking, even though it could be difficult and hard? And how did you decide to go to Niagara? Um, Niagara was one of those, I mean, places that I said, okay, well, I lived in Florida for three years already. And I wanted to play with my best friend, which is Alvin Cruz. Um, we went to high school together and we, we decided to go to university together. You know, because I obviously had other offers, high level offers to go to other schools. But I said, look, we're going to do this together. We're going to go in at a university and, and try to make history like we did in high school. So that was one of my first, um, first thoughts and, and the process of me going to university with my, my best friend. Uh, yeah, that, that was my decision. And then I just said, okay, well, let's, let's get this going and play together and try to win a championship, uh, at the Mac level uh, in Niagara. And, uh, it, it worked out, it worked out for the best, but, um, yeah, that's how, that's how it came about, man. And what other schools were you recruited by? Well, Long list. I have a long list. Uh, I had New Mexico. I had a lot of a lot of schools, but top of the list were like New Mexico, uh, Georgia Southern, Arkansas State, Arkansas. You know, I had a lot of schools looking at me, but um, yeah, I chose Niagara because I, I figured, you know what, it's a perfect fit. You know, I could I get to play basketball with with who is my best friend to this day um, for another four years, and then uh, yeah, see what see what happens there. But that's those are amongst the schools, but there was a lot of schools looking at me at the time that I just don't have the top of my head, but those, those stick out the most. And when you first got to Niagara, did you, did you see your career going the way that it did? No, no. Um, uh, I, you know, I, my coach, Joe Mahalik at the time, which is at Hofstra University now, uh, told me one thing, because, you know, obviously in the NCAA, you get to, uh, go on recruiting visits. I went on a couple of recruiting visits, but what I liked about him was his transparency and the realness of his conversation with me as a young adult coming to Niagara, which which really led me to 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 go there. So basically, the conversation. You might imagine this: the conversation went like this, very simple. One, you're not going to play your first few years because we have several guys ahead of you. Um, just work hard, and if you work hard and you show me you're able to, uh, you will play. So, you know, when, when somebody hears that, usually your decision of going to that place is going to be, it's, it's clearly no, because they have no spot for you. But 
Um, I felt it was genuine. I felt he was honest about the whole situation. And I decided to say, okay, well, I'll stick this one out. And could it have gone different? Of course. Everything could always go different. It could always go your way. But like I told you, I'm a fighter. I stuck it out, and thing, things turned out great. Did you ever regret going to Niagara? Do I regret? No. Nothing in life I do, I regret. I don't, I don't regret. Like, life, you're meant to go through ups and downs. You're meant to go through uh, good times, bad times. It's just how you handle the situation. And that's the way I always see it. I always see it that way. I try to tell uh, my six-year-old daughter all the time, listen, sometimes things won't go the way you want, but it's what you do about it, right? And that's, uh, that's something I live by. And as long as you, you believe in what you believe in and you, you're strong and you stand to the core of who you are as a person, I could sleep at night, you know, and I don't have an issue with that. Right. Um, what was your first college game like? Were you nervous? Or were you, well, you don't get scared, you said. No, I don't get scared. <laughs> I don't get scared. So my first college game, well, mind you, my first college game, um, we played George Mason University at the Gallagher Center, which is in Niagara. I didn't see a minute. I did not see a minute. My freshman year, I remember it. My family came down from Montreal, went to Niagara, and I didn't even step on the court. So you can just imagine how I'm feeling, right? Obviously, I didn't get on the court. That shows my family that basically they drove for six hours to watch me sit the bench, which is fine. You know, um, that just fueled me even more. You know, that pushed me even harder because I said, the next time they come, this will not repeat itself. That I promised. So I remember it like it was yesterday because it was a, a fellow Canadian on the other side, Jesse Young, who played on the national team, who, who was a very good player at the time and was playing. And I said, okay, that's the guy I'm chasing. I'm, I'm going to be better than that guy. One day, with time, I will be better. So, um was it a bad experience? No. Was it a great experience? No. But at the same time, it's something that I will always cherish, and, 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 and it made me stronger. It made me into a, a better person when it comes to understanding the system and understanding how things work and, and working through it without having to actually, uh, you know, put myself into a position where I'm not going to be successful. So you have to have a mindset, and I always tell it to student athletes, you have to, you have to be resilient. You have to have a mindset to where anything, whatever happens, like this pandemic, you got to just overcome and try to get on top, regardless of, regardless of the situation, because things change in life. Like a basketball game, every possession is different. Never the same. Very rare it's the same, right? So I try to take life the same way. Do you feel like you should have played more your freshman year, or do you think that you got the minutes that you deserved? Well, uh, uh, a lot of things could have played into why I didn't start which was maybe the experience, the playbook. Um, you know, coach has had his reasons, right? Uh, a lot of things, a lot of things could have happened differently, yes. Um, if I would have been a different player, if coach really recruited me for me and said, okay, you're going to start when you come in. I didn't want to hear that stuff. I wanted reality. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to get hit and get back up and get hit and continue getting back up. So, I mean, for me, it was, it was perfect because I ended up playing 23 minutes a game and still averaging nine and eight. So, I mean, am I going to complain as a freshman? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But could I play more? Of course, I'm always going to say yes. Yeah. And the next time your family came to see you play, do you remember how you played? Yes. Well, no, I don't remember the first time. After that, but I remember the last. And the last time they saw me play at the Gallagher Center, I, uh, I had a career high in the gym. Um, it was my first, my, my dad's first game there. So, and, and, we, and we got the W because me, I'm all about team, and we got the W in overtime against our rival school. So it was a bittersweet. You know, so those are the games I really remember, and that's very important to me. The first time I saw you play, you put my, I came down to see my brother play. He played for Central Connecticut. Yeah. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, Sobers. Yeah, yeah. I remember the name. I remember your brother's <laughs> I name. I don't I want to embarrass him, but, but you <laughs> played, you scored a lot of points. And yeah. I went home and I looked up your stats and I'm like, wow, this guy's, I don't know why this guy isn't getting more notoriety or 
recognition yeah. for what he's doing. Did you feel like you deserved more recognition for what you were doing? Because you averaged 20 points a game for like two seasons, right? Yeah. 18, 20, 20, 23. 18, 20, 23. Yeah. Um, do I right. deserve more? Um, I don't know. You know, I don't, uh, I don't look at uh, what it could have been. In the moment, I try to live the moment. I try to make it uh, the best I can given the situation I'm put into, right? I mean, that's what you try to do in life. You know, if, if they give you lemons, you make lemon juice, right? So it's like, this is how I lived. And, and I didn't see it as, okay, well, do I deserve more? No, I was never resentful. I appreciated the opportunity. I relished the moment. And yeah, it's one of those things where I just, I embraced it regardless of, of who was playing, who wasn't playing. Um, if the coach liked me, if the coach didn't like me, I was going to do what I was able to do regardless of any given situation. Then your brother, Thomas, said, what's up? <laughs> Tom, I'm sorry. Yeah, I had to do it. <laughs> Is there anybody that changed your life that that doesn't know that they changed your life the amount that they did? Um, you know, along the way when you when you play, and uh, you know you go through these these life these life altering moments. There's a lot of people that you have to thank. Right? Obviously, your family, close friends. Uh, along the way, you have girlfriends and whatnot. I mean, they all mold you who you are moving forward so one person for me to say I would I would go if you talk about basketball it's my, it's my best friend Alvin Cruz because he he taught me a lot you know he taught me how to handle some situations that I, that if I was alone I think I would handle way differently right so I would give him a lot of credit for uh, the molding of me as a basketball player now off the court there's a lot of people that I thank you know, obviously my girlfriend right now that I have now, soon to be fiance. Um, she's like family. Obviously my mother, my, my older brothers and whatnot. But there's a lot of people that, that mold me into who I am. And when it comes to basketball, I give the, the, the trophy to Alvin. But, you know, obviously everything plays a part. You know, your personal life, on the court, off the court, that all plays a big role. So um, I can't just say one person, but I'm, I'm happy where I'm at now in life and and it's worked out well. Did any part of basketball come super naturally easy for you? Like when you picked it up, did you, were you just like, wow, this is easier than I thought? Well, look, it, nothing's ever easy. Um, I thought when I started playing, uh, I had the tools. It was more of just working as hard as I can um, trying to be as relentless as possible to be the best player I can be. So every practice, I'll make sure I'm the hardest worker. You know what I mean? I, I would sleep on it. I'll think about what could I do better? How could I achieve things that I wasn't able to do the, the prior game or the prior season? And I just try to get better as a person, like every day, right? In life, you try to be better as a person every day, even with the mistakes you make. You try to better yourself, regard, I mean, regardless of the situation. So that's how I see it in basketball, and that's how I see it in life also. Was it hard? Or not, I don't want to say it was it hard, but Challenging. how hard did you have to score those, those 20 points a game for almost three straight seasons? Hard? I don't think it was hard. Um, there were situations where it could have been easier. A lot of situations, a lot of years, it could have been easier. Uh, but I just, I believed in, in what I could do, I was able to do, right? I'll let people, you know, because in a lot of teams, you have obviously the, the, the alpha males. Right? There's always more than just one person who you're trying to compete against. It's not that you're not just competing against uh, the refs and the other team, you're competing against your own counterparts, right? So. Yeah, you, you go through that, but I was just mentally strong and I just didn't, I didn't let it bother me to the point where I was going to let it make me fail, right? So whatever it took to win, whatever it took to get to that next level, I was going to do regardless of the situation. Yeah. But was it easy? No, 
not, it's never easy, especially when you know you have your brother and other people trying to guard you, double team you, and trying to stop you from scoring those points. So that's just one facet of the game. You play, did you play angry or um, angry? Calm? calm, very calm because I, I knew what I was able to do, right? Um, pressure never, I never believed in pressure. You know, uh, pressure over people who are in, in other countries going to war, that's pressure because your life is on the line. Playing basketball, yeah. my life is not on the line, right? Uh, being a doctor, having to save someone's life, that's pressure because you're the, that person's life is in your hand. But playing basketball is just like uh, a walk through the park. You know, there's no pressure. There's no pressure at all. I don't believe in that. Did you ever fight on the court? Yes. I've, I've had my scuffles. Uh, don't want to get into it right now, but uh, there's been some scuffles. But uh, at the end of the day, it's always for the good. I never, I'll never fight to bully or dominate someone through physical, you know, to physical physicality, no, not not my game. So, if if I'm fighting, you know there's something wrong. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. And what lessons do young kids or young student athletes have to learn to to play at the highest level and to be successful? What must they do versus what? Like, what should they stay away from? Okay, so for me, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. You work hard, uh, dedicate your time to your craft. Uh, depending on how, like, what level you want to play at. And just be ready to take criticism because a lot of kids now, they're so sensitive. Everything is about me, 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 me. And they don't, they're not ready to take criticism to get themselves better, right? Sometimes you might hear criticism you don't want to hear. A lot of times I didn't want to hear a lot of things I had to hear, but guess what? I would sit there, swallow that pill, move forward, and take the good out of the conversation, not the bad. So... What I give kids is just, you know, stay the course. If you believe you could be an athlete uh, at the highest level, keep plugging away, grind, and just be mentally tough. You know, that's one of the things that I always uh, try to tip my hat to when I talk to people is mentally tough is, is, is a gift. Like, I mean, you, you, you don't teach that. You, know, you have it or you don't, you know. Don't get don't get uh, swayed away by social media. Don't get swayed away by other other influences around you. Just continue the course and do what you need to do. How do you think you would have handled being a student athlete in today's time in 2020? Well, today's time is a different. Remember, my my game translated very well. Would translate very well now, I think, because I, I could shoot the ball from outside. I could play inside, and I was a little undersized at my t in, in my time. Um, I think it would be very easy for me now. And then the fouls are totally like, – they don't call fouls no more. So I'll get, I'll get whatever I want when I want. So instead of averaging 20, 23 points, I'll average like 28, 30, easy, right? Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would easily, easily have played at a higher level, you know. So that's my opinion. I don't know. Who knows? How would you have handled the off-court stuff? Well, off court stuff, I'm very, I'm very low key with the on court stuff. I, I I try to stay away from all that stuff, regardless. When it comes to being a pro, uh, college, obviously, you know, you, like coach, coaches always say you're in a glass house. Everybody watches what you do. So, I was always good on just you know sticking to what I need to stick to, which was play basketball and get my education, and focus on the the big picture, which was winning games. You know, helping the program and getting my education. So, I mean, that would have been very easy for me. As long as I had food on, on the table and my room that I could sleep on, I'm good. I'm good. A little PlayStation at the time, PlayStation 2, Xbox, good. But, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult for me. And what did you major in? Uh, business and sociology. Okay. Yeah. And was it hard to do that and play basketball? At your level? Well, it, was, it, it wasn't hard because we were able to, for example, take courses during the course of the year, and it was mandatory for us to come to summer school. So because we came to summer school every summer, by the time you hit your senior year, you, you, you need, you're done. You're done what you need to do for the bachelor's, bachelor degree. Um, so by my senior year, I only had to take uh, a couple courses. I didn't really have 
much to do, you know, because I was coming in the summers and getting my uh, my schooling done. So that wasn't an issue. Did you play with any guys who didn't take the schooling part of the game seriously and had to leave the school? Well, you know what? The, the coach we had at the time, which Joe Mahalik, Hofstra University, he, he did a great job of making sure everybody's in line with academics. You know, he didn't try to get knuckleheads to come on board and, and ruin what he was working so hard for to get everybody to buy into academics, which is very important because without academics, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, you know, because basketball, obviously, the ball deflates after a couple of years and your skills diminish and you have to stop playing the game, but education will always go with you everywhere you go. When you graduated, what, what did you immediately do? Well, it was, my graduation, it was tough because I had to, um, during the course of the season, we went to the tournament. We lost, uh, we lost first round. But then, because I did so well, I had like uh, the Chicago, Chicago pre-draft camp. I had uh, a camp in uh, Portsmouth, right? Invitational. Right. So I was I was really busy. I was really busy. And then I went into summer league. Did summer league uh, with the Heat, um, and then jumped into my pro career. Uh, in September in Italy. So, I mean, I, there was no stopping after the season was over and I graduated. Oh, so, and on national team also. So, it was a lot of things going on in my life at that point in time. Yes. You played on the summer league team and the national team yes. at the same time, right? Yes, yes. Were you exhausted at all? Or? Was I exhausted? No, because I was, what, 22, 23 years old? I'm not going to – you have so much energy to – to give right, and then and then school was done for me, so I had so much more time on my hands. You know, it's one thing waking up at eight o'clock in the morning, having to go to class, having to practice at two, then going back to class, and then your day is done at eight p.m. and then you're exhausted, you know, in school. But when when I graduated, it was just strictly basketball, so I could solely focus on basketball, and it it, it made it that much easier. And out of the Chicago pre-draft camp and the yeah. Portland Invitational and Summer League yeah. mm -hmm. playing for the national team, what was the most challenging competition that you you experienced? Well, you, they're all they're all challenging because you play you play against pros, the high level pros, right? Um, in the Summer League, we'll play against the Lakers. Their first round draft picks, they're pros, right? Then you go on the national team. National team is pretty difficult because now you're playing against. Uh, the country's best, like, the best players who play in the NBA. So, I mean, every level has its challenges. Um, is it, was it hard? It was, it was different. It wasn't hard, but it was different. I had to adjust, right, with the speed of the game, the physicality, because obviously I'm coming from the college game, going into playing against uh, on a night-to-night -night basis, uh, basically men who are all pros, top-notch pros. So, I mean, the adjustment to that took some time. I think it took a couple months, but uh, I mean, I was fine. I could help. I could hold my own, you know. So it's different. It's just different, you know. What I what I really enjoyed about those uh, those experiences was the ex uh, you 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 learn so much without even knowing. You learn so much because now you're you're picking at the brain of the older guys who've been around the game longer than you have, and you try to use those tools to. Enhance your game, which I did. Who, which older pro um, did you used to be around the most? Uh, yes. Uh, so on the national team, um, it was Rowan Barrett, RJ, RJ Barrett's dad. Yeah. Rowan was a, a mentor to me. He would talk to me a lot, you know, knowing I was only like 18, 19 years old at the time. He would talk to me and let me know, look, you're going to be the future of this country. You have to do certain things a certain way. But all the guys, Peter Garacci, Gray Newton, Sean Swords, all these guys I'm naming to you are guys that uh, helped me a lot throughout the process. So um, I can't just give one guy credit, but him, he's the one that will talk to me the most out of all those guys. And I had the opportunity to see him firsthand uh, at the Pan Americans in 2003 um, display who he was as a player and as a person. He's even a greater person. So, um, yeah, he's one of those guys. Did you always want to play for Canada, or did they approach you and convince you to do well, it? Well, I'm, I'm very close with Jay Triano because he's a Niagara Falls guy. Um, he came, I remember, I think it was my freshman year, he came to Niagara to see a shooter that we had, Mike Schmidt at the time, 
who was a very good shooter. Mike Schmidt. Mike Schmidt, yes. Mike Schmidt, he was Texas, I think Texas A&M, and then transferred to Niagara. I think Jay Trano came to see him play. And then uh, uh, he caught my, like, he, I, I caught his eye because of the way I played my game as a freshman. And we kept in contact. And then he gave me the opportunity that summer to play on the, on the national team, just to try out. It was a long shot. I tried out. I made it. I was kind of happy. You know, that was a, a milestone and a half for me because I was only 19 years old. And that was the Olympic, the last Olympic team we had. So I was able to develop with these guys and they helped me a lot through that course of the summer. But yes, I had the opportunity to play for the national team and Dominican national team, which I don't really talk about too much. But I chose Canada because Canada, I was born here, raised here. And at the time, that's all I knew. So you're an Olympian as well? No, I didn't go on the Olympic team. Remember, they didn't qualify. They qualified for the team that I played on. Uh, they were the 2002 Olympic team, right? Oh. I came in. I came in in 2003. So that same team, I played with them, which they were the Olympic team, but they didn't qualify. We didn't qualify for 2004 because Steve Nash didn't play, and you know a lot of political aspects of the game went on with these decisions. But yeah, that's what happened. Do you think that Canada basketball needs to do anything to get their pros to commit to the team? My thing is, is uh, I love Canada. I love Canada basketball. Uh, a lot of things need to change, in my opinion. I think they are. They have the right people in place now to make these changes. I think Rowan's doing a very good job as a GM, and Steve, obviously, Steve Nash speaks for himself, just the name. Um, he's pushing the program in the right, the, the right direction. Like they say, it's the golden golden era for basketball in Canada because yeah. uh, all these players now are NBA guys, but at the same time, it's just trying to find the right fit to make these guys excel at the international level. And I think they're doing a very good job at that, right? So um, I'm very proud. I'm looking forward to seeing the team play. And I think we'll be very good. Very, very good. Do you think that we could win a gold medal? An Olympic could we win a gold medal? medal? I wouldn't, I, I mean, I'll never discredit that. Never. I always believe in my country. I always believe we're able to. It's just how much work are you willing to put in? How much time are you really dedicating to, to doing this kind of stuff? So, look, we have what? Jamal Murray, Wiggins, uh, Olenek, Tristan. Uh, there's so much players. And then the players who are on the come up, you know, like you, you put those guys on a roster, they're going to be, they're going to be hard to stop. Right? And they're young. You know, you're not talking about guys who are older. So uh, they got a bright future, man. Canada basketball is a real bright future. Yeah, I hope they win a gold medal one day. Hey, trust me, I'll be, I'll be in the forefront watching this. I'll be on the forefront watching this. So, yes, looking forward I to that. Choose number 43 to play in. I'll tell you because uh, <clears throat> in, in high school, I was 44. And when I got to Niagara, somebody already had 44. So... I said, okay, well, what's the next number that I could use that exemplifies my game? So I'm a four-man who could actually shoot the three. So 43. People don't know that, though, but obviously. Now you know. That's hot take. Hot take. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you wish you knew 15 years ago that you knew now? So right yeah, now, I If I could go back 15 years? Yeah. Uh a uh, little more patient. You know, you, when you're young, you want to do things so fast. You, you don't want to – you want everything to go perfect, but obviously you don't know um, how to do it. And you think you know how to do it because now you you think you're at an age where nobody can tell you nothing. Um, yeah, just more patience, believing in the system, believing in, in other people's opinions instead of just being stubborn because I was kind of stubborn at, at – some point in times in my life 15 years ago. Um, yeah, that's really about it. Nothing else. How would you treat your younger self? Like if you met him? If I met my uh, me 15 years ago, okay, well, I'll start off with you don't know everything. <laughs> um, just enjoy, enjoy the process because the process is what makes you you know, if you told me this 15 years ago, that the process is what's going to make you as a man and make you mold you as a person, I'll tell you no way. It's the other way around. It's not the case.
And how much, what part of your life yeah. that you learn from your family, your family life, did you um, take into basketball? Did I, did I take into basketball? What did I, me personally, my family, resilient group, uh, very loyal, very loyal to each other. Um, I think the loyalty part, the trust, the aspect of just being loyal and believing in one another. I mean, that's, that's a credit to my mom who's very resilient as a Brazilian as a person. Um, she raised a lot of kids, so she's very tough. So I got that toughness out of her. Um, I just believe in what I believe in, you know, and sometimes I can rub people the wrong way, but I mean, I got that from my mama. You know how people say you got that from your mama. That's what I got from my mom. So I'll stick to that and, and just enjoy it and try to do the same for my kids and always believe, you know, always believe. Are you, do you believe in God? Yes, I believe there's something out there. I believe there's a God. I believe there's a higher being. You know, I, I, I don't really um, talk about religion too much because that's a sensitive uh, subject to a lot of people. But, I mean, is there something out there? Yes, there is. Whatever it is, whatever the case, whatever you want to call it, he's out there or she's out there, whatever, I don't know, whatever. It's, it's a higher being. So, um, yeah, I believe in it. And I respect every religion. I respect everybody's beliefs. You know, that's your choice. Um, but yeah, I believe in it. What lessons do you want to teach your children? Lessons. Well, there's a lot of lessons you're going to have to teach children, right? But right. Uh, my, my lesson to my children at all costs is just believe in what you believe in. Uh, be tough. If you fall, get up. You know, don't don't wait for somebody to give you a hand me down. Just do it on your own. Try to try to do things on your own. If you need help, get the help you need. But at the same time, believe in yourself. You know, because a lot of cases, uh, especially with the times now with this Black Lives Matter, um, as black as a black athlete, you don't get the opportunity. You do and you don't in a lot of cases, depending on the situation. You know, and just not even just athletes, just students in general, right? Um, just to believe in yourself and grow as a person, believing that you could do anything and nobody's going to be able to stop you regardless of the situation. And given everything that goes on in life, I mean, you still have to push through. Because before you were born, before I was born, they've been pushing to try yeah. to make things change. You know, so, I mean, that's one of the things that I, uh, I try to install in my daughter to just keep pushing regardless of the situation and try to get the positive out of every situation she's in and you've been all around the world did you ever experience any racism while playing or just living well i i don't from my recollection i mean for sure there's racism okay but i don't i just believe that a lot of people right they don't when they don't understand something they're very ignorant to the fact okay so I I never tried to live through racism remarks or I never I never took it to heart because some people just don't know and they'll never understand and even if they do understand that's their opinion you just got to move forward regardless of the situation right I've dealt with obviously issues but I try not to focus the negative and try to just dwell on the positive because more, the more positive you have in your life the more positive energy around you good things happen you have a hero? Hero. Well, my hero has always been my mom. My mom is my hero. I don't have, uh, you know, I have, I have basketball players I do like, you know, I have football players who I, you know, admire their skill and their talents, but my hero's been my mom. It's always been the case. Hasn't changed even to today. Um, it's one of those people that I always remember and I've taken so much from her life, even though there's ups and downs, I've always taken the positive and, and run with it and try to carry that in my life. So, yeah, that's her. And how much has becoming a father changed who you are as a person? It's changed a lot. It's changed a lot. I, I, I think I'm more calm. I am um, a calmer person. Uh, it's great being a dad. I mean, that's the best, that's the best investment you could have in life. You know, everything else is just secondary. 
having a child is one of those things where, you know, now you're, you're their all, you're their hero. You're the one who teaches them uh, the, the, the way to live life. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's challenging at times, you know, you get surprised because of the evolution of, of a human being growing right in front of you and it's yours, you know, you could say it's yours. So um, it's a blessing. You know, when you have children, it's a blessing. I have one, I'm about to have a couple, a few more coming soon uh, to be announced. But uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, and I have the opportunity to do that as a father and teach her what I know and incorporate her life now, her lifestyle now to, to my old lifestyle because obviously we're getting older. We're not getting younger. So, I mean, it's, it's fun. I enjoy it. Were you scared or nervous to become a father? Uh, no, I had to I had a decision to make. Do I retire and become a father or do I continue playing and not become a father and just let my daughter see me grow as a dad, you know, over Zoom calls and, and overseas. So I, I made a decision. I said, look, it's the right decision to make. I played enough basketball in my time. Let me stop this and focus on, on one thing that's really important and what I'm going to leave here for the, I mean, what I'm going to leave here when I, when I pass away one day is, is going to be my family. So I got to teach her everything while I have the time now. Do you want her to play basketball? Say what? You want her to play basketball? No, she can do whatever she wants. She can do whatever she wants. I, I don't push her to no sports. She's athletically gifted, I think. At a young age, she's six. So, I mean, I could see that she's she's built to play a sport. But do I force her? No. She's able to do whatever she wants. She's in gymnastics. I want to put her into tennis. Whatever she wants to do and she feels great at doing, hey, enjoy that. Do it. Do it to the best of your ability. That's all I ask. And what type of father do you want to be? What type of father? Uh, just a good dad. A father who's there for his family, a father who uh, could take care of situations when it's a, when when it confronts, you know, and give the best advice as I can as a father while I'm on this earth, and hope uh, you know the message is really properly, and my my children could take it and run with it, and be be a better version of me. So, that's it. Um, do you think that college athletes should be paid? I think so. They should. The industry, the industry makes too much money off these student athletes, right? And the only thing they give them is a is a scholarship during the course of the year, right, and some food. But I think compensation should have been done a long time ago. I believe that the student athlete. Remember, a lot of student athletes are from uh, African American descent, right? Coming from uh, homes that don't have the financial means or gains to help the athlete. So I believe that that could be a big help for the families, less stress, and it could help the student athlete, you know, make decisions on his own at a younger age, instead of waiting till he's 23, 24, getting a pro contract and blowing it. You know, he can learn in school on why, like when he gets this money, on how to use it, how to invest it. And now education comes and plays a big part because now they're learning how to, right? So that's my opinion. Um, when you were in your senior year, or which year? Yeah. Did which you ever year, experience um, like agents contacting you while you were still well, playing? Agents, agents started contacting me my senior year. My senior year, so because you're, that's the only time you're allowed after the season's over. So I didn't really get into agents before that. I didn't bother. I was focused on school. I was focused on my season. I didn't want to have no distractions whatsoever. And do you think if you played today, would you have stayed four years in at university? I think I would have. I think I would have for the educational standpoint. You know, I would have stayed for the four years and then gone pro for sure. I would have been in the NBA this like with my game. It would have translated perfect for this type of this type of game now. So, I think I would have waited the four years, graduated, and then gone to the NBA. Absolutely. Who's the best player you ever played with? With or against? With and against. Well, there's LeBron and Kobe. Those guys, obviously, their their track record speaks for itself. But uh, against, those are the best guys I've played against. With the best player, Steve Nash is is one of those guys that Canada obviously knows as the greatest to ever play the game here. 
Um, uh, but I believe who I played with, it all depends on what, what position you want to you wanna dive into. But I think with, yeah, I think Rowan Barrett. Rowan Barrett. Wow. I'll give it to Rowan. I'll give it to Row. I'll give it to Row. He might be surprised I said that, but I'll give it to him. And Kobe Bryant and LeBron James, when you played against them, was yeah. there anything in particular that they just – that made them the best players you ever played against, or was it – It's how- just – you know what? They, they, they were just – they were just good. They are just good physically, mentally. They just knew what to do. They knew how to do it. Like, there was no uh, – they're just amazing, right? And this is in their primes. This is like 10 years ago. So these guys all in their primes, like they're playing against just one of them is a, is a headache. Imagine playing against all, both of them on the same on the same floor. It's kind of hard. But I mean, those guys, they just know how to play the game the right way. They play it the right way. You know, they play hard, uh, <coughs> sound decisions. Uh, and obviously athletically, they're gifted. So, I mean, that's what makes them, right? And their drive, their drive is, by far, I see a lot of people who have the drive but don't have the skill set or the talent. These guys have it all. Right? So, yeah, those guys are by far the best. By far. And when you were growing up, who was your favorite basketball player? MJ. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Do you think he's Not the greatest? Not so much as Dan. Do I think he's the greatest? Me, personally, yeah. I'm biased. I'm biased when it comes to MJ. So, I believe... I believe Michael Jordan is the best ever to do it only because of his tenacity, his willingness to give up everything to win. You know, and I mean, Kobe was great, replica, right? Uh, I think physically, the uh, the most talented player to ever play the game is LeBron James, physically. Okay, physically. But when it comes to just sheer willingness to win, my man MJ, can't beat it, cannot. I think it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but... Um, ah, oh, you're going about Battle of the Bigs? Kareem. Well, it, it all depends on how you see that, yeah. too, right? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is one of those guys where he did so much off the court. So, you know, you could you could really say, yeah, he, he's one of the best, but, yeah, Kareem, Kareem had a great career. And he, still, and he still does a lot for the basketball community, so hats off to him. He had a great, great career in college also, right? When you talk about from... From high school, college, NBA, I say Kareem. But when you talk about just the NBA, I say Michael Jordan. My opinion. Who was the first player that you played against that, or who's the first player you played against that you could admit that they were better than you? Uh, There's a guy named uh, Robert Battle, my sophomore year, Drexel University. Okay. We, we played Drexel. I was a 20-year-old sophomore and 19, 20-year-old sophomore. And he, he came into the gym. He averaged, I think he got 20-some-odd 20, 20 rebounds and like 30 points in one night. I said, damn, this guy. This guy's an animal. He was an animal. He was just the motor, could play at a high level, you know, every second he was on the floor. And it was it was it was a lot for me. I think it was my freshman year, not even sophomore. It was my freshman year because my sophomore year we played them and I and I matched up pretty well. But my freshman year, that was I I could clearly say that guy was way better than me. My freshman year, yes. <laughs> um, what was growing up in Montreal like? Growing up in Montreal, very, very different. Um, obviously, as you know. Province of Quebec people speak a lot of French. Uh, I lived in an Anglophone community mixed with French. So there was always that divide, you know, always an issue at a young age. Um, But yeah, uh, obviously racism played its part. Um, Language barrier played its part. But it was, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, you know. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. And were you happy? Well, I asked this question earlier, but if the racism, if you experienced racism when you were younger in Montreal, were you happier to leave Montreal 
to get out of there to go to Florida? Uh, I was happy to leave, but racism exists everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. You know, it exists. It's just the level of existence could be higher or lower. It just depends on where you are. And I, I expected that, right? If you grew up with it, you expect it. It's not. It's nothing new. This is this is a norm for people, which is which is wrong. But at the end of the day, um, just try not to just try and make it not bother me, right? Just live through life as best way as possible, and and try to achieve things that you know could maybe make people see you differently, you know, instead of just assuming the worst at all times. Going into your senior year at Niagara, yep. were you focusing on um, team achievements or personal mm -hmm. achievements? Team achievements. Team. I, I, my whole career was there. Was it was about team because <clears throat> I wanted to win. Okay, it was thirty-five years. The team didn't go to the NCAA tournament. Right. My freshman year, we got close. We lost in the finals. So, uh, sophomore year, we got really close. Got, lost double overtime to Manhattan, who ended up beating Florida. You know, and we, and we thought we were better than they were. We lost by one. My junior year, same scenario. We lost by one to Manhattan, right? And then senior year, I said, look, my sole goal is just to win this all because people wouldn't remember me if I didn't win. I could have had all the points in the world. But if you don't win, I mean, what, what are people going to really hang their hats on? Well, he came here and did his job. He came here, got us a MAC title, and then moved on his way. And that's, that was my goal. I was satisfied when, when we won our, our MAC conference. Even though I wanted to win in the tournament, I mean, that was the ultimate goal for me. What did you do immediately after winning the MAC title? Well, we were in Buffalo. So um, the team stayed in Buffalo the night. And then we ended up coming the next day uh, back, to, um, back to campus. But I remember after I was done, I felt like a big weight was lifted because there was so much pressure on, you know, it was a lot of pressure for the coach. His mom had cancer, you know what I mean? My senior year, when is the school going to go back to the tournament, and blah, blah, blah. So a lot of people were questioning on, is this, is this it? Is this their last go-around? Because we've done it for like the last four years before that, three years before that. So, I mean, that's, I think, the most pressure, if you want to call it pressure, I don't think it's pressure. I think it's just a relief more than pressure, relief. That was the most relief I had when we won because it's like, wow, I gave all I got. I gave the fans what they wanted, and that's that. And I was satisfied. I was happy. And you're one of, like, 27 players in the last 20 years to get 2,000 points and 1,000 rebounds. When you were playing, when did you realize that this was an achievement that you can get? You know, during my playing career, uh, I didn't think about that. I thought about just winning games, right? Uh, that It came up, I think, in my senior year when uh, the national team came down to Niagara and they told me, listen, Juan, you're about 30 or 40 points away from breaking the all-time uh, leading score against a history uh, at Niagara as a Division One player. It was my senior year. I did not know. Uh, I think he, if you, you might recognize his name, Michael Grange. I think he's, uh, he works for Toronto, uh, the Toronto Star, as a reporter, and he's an analyst for the Raptors. He was the first one to come down to St. Bonnie's and tell me about this. But I wasn't paying no mind to it because obviously we had games, we had to play. Um, and I never sat, I, I never took the time to sit back and actually think about it while I was playing because you know, there's so much things going on, so you don't have the time to really reflect on what's really happening. I didn't know how big that would have been living in the moment. You know what I mean? Now I see it and it's like, wow, what a, what a feat. You know, it's, it's a pretty good feat. Um, well, but, yeah, that's, that's, how it, that's how it was when I was playing. So you, you scored all those points, and then when you got to that 2,000 points, did they stop the game and give you the ball or anything? They didn't give me the ball. Uh, I, the only thing I remember was uh, the game was in Manhattan. I think we we just I think we just beat them, or I think we lost. I think we lost the game. So I was more upset that we lost. I didn't care about the record. 
And then the next day, I remember my mom calling me from Montreal, me and Niagara on campus, saying I was on the front page of the newspaper. So I was kind of excited. I enjoyed that because I never had no recognition in uh, in the city here. So that was the first of many. And yeah, I mean, I was still kind of upset because we lost. So I didn't really think about it. Wow. That, I, I would imagine the game would have stopped and then given the ball. And... No, no. Even if it did, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have liked that to happen that way because remember basketball is a team sport at the end of the day. Yeah, my accolades are my accolades, but with all my, my teammates, I wouldn't be where I wouldn't be in the position I'm in today with all this success, right? Um, so I, I don't believe that, yeah, it's a great thing it happened. I did it. I'm very fortunate. I got put in position to be successful, but without those guys, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had that. You know, I wouldn't have had it. So I was happy the way the way it played out. We lost the game. We got on the bus and we went back to the hotel. And yeah, we worried more about the game than the individual stats. So yeah, that's what happened. Do you think you're the greatest player in your school history? No, no, I don't. I think uh, Calvin Murphy is. He deserves that. He he did a lot more than I did, uh, given he only played three years at Niagara. Um, he's the greatest to ever lace him up. So I give him that. Me, the second best. Close, close, second best. But he's the best player to ever come to Niagara. He, he would kill me if I say otherwise, too. So I, I wouldn't want to go there. <laughs> yeah. How do you want to be remembered from those that uh, is around you? A winner. You know, uh, you you do these things. You do a lot of things in life to not just to be a winner, but just to leave your mark to leave a legacy, right? I I don't care how much money I made. I don't care about uh, what uh, what people say. It's more of what you've, what mark, what mark have you left, you know, in life, you know, to your kids, uh, to, to other student athletes, to the community. What have you left that people can remember you? Because eventually we're all going to die. It's just more of... Um, leaving that legacy, right? And and that's what I think I did at Niagara, and, and that's what I, I had my head off. You know, I had my head off to that. So I'm proud of that. Because the day I decided, you know, die, obviously that that will always be there. You know, like, for example, they just retired my jersey there a couple of years ago, and every time you look up, you're going to see my name, and people will ask questions. So for me, that's enough. Was it important for you to get your jersey retired, or did you not? Care? Say what? Was it important for you to get your jersey retired, or did you not? Care about was it important? That? Well, another crazy story. My daughter was born the same day I got my jersey retired, so I had a decision to make, uh -huh. and I didn't. I didn't go to the. I didn't go to the uh, the ceremony. So, what well, they knew, you know. So I had my daughter, and I chose family over, over fame, and it's just that's that's my life. That's the way it is. You know, uh, was I surprised? No. Um, I did enough to get accredited that. You know, I got my degree, I, all this, uh, you know, all the points, and then I brought the team to the tournament. So, I mean, do I fit the bill? Yeah, of course. But did I expect it so soon? No. <laughs> no. But it happened, and, and I'm very I'm thankful, I'm very fortunate, you know, and – even if it's just my name there, there's, uh, say, about 25 guys whose name should be on the back of that flag also because they're the ones that helped me get to those, point, those points in my career. What kind of future do you see for yourself? Right now? Yeah. Well, well build, build my family, you know, create a dynasty when it comes to family. You know, that's uh, the main goal. Uh, just be the best father. Be the best father. I try to mentor kids who are going through the same process that I went through. I try to guide them in the right direction, you know, because I didn't have that growing up. I just, I did a lot of things alone because I, I didn't have nobody around me who could push me to those levels. So um, just be, just be the best person I can be to help others achieve goals that they, they never even dreamed of. 
And are you doing that? Are are you doing that now? Helping yes. others. Yes. So so what I'm doing now is I uh, uh, I recruit I recruit kids, and I try to guide them into uh, paths to where they can become successful. You know, try to give them the opportunity that a lot of kids don't get. You know, to achieve their their goals when it comes to basketball and uh, first and foremost uh, academically. So that's what I do at the moment, and I'm very proud of it because you know, I don't want to be an agent, but I do want to help these kids get to where they need to be when it comes academically. And which city do you think produces the best basketball players in Canada? Whoa, it's a tough question. <laughs> Bible, I'm always in, I'm going to be biased again. I, I say Montreal. Montreal, we have a lot of good athletes here. But Toronto has taken, taken, taken those reins the last few years. But uh, Montreal produces a lot of good players. Toronto, I think Toronto and Montreal. You know, Toronto, Montreal. And last question. What was the no wildest locker room experience that you've ever seen? Well, I'm going to go to Central Connecticut. I'm going <laughs> to go to Central Connecticut. So I think it was my sophomore year in Central Connecticut playing your brother. Um, we were playing, and the game, the lights went out in the game. It's like I shot a shot, and I think you have to tell them this, okay? So technically, I scored uh, 2,000, what was it, 2,010 points, right? It's supposed to be 2,008, 2,208 points, okay? So long story short, we're in Central Connecticut. There's a couple minutes left before the half, Right? I shoot a shot. The ball doesn't go in because I clearly see it doesn't go in, but the lights go out. And I told the ref, listen, it went in, it went in. So they gave us the two points. The game stopped. We came back the next day and finished off the game. So that was one of the wildest uh, experiences I've had. Sort of like halftime, but yeah, it was in Central Connecticut when the lights went out. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much for allowed me to interview you. It's been a pleasure. No problem. Hey, thank you. You made me reminisce, man. It's been a while. I haven't talked about Niagara in so much uh, in such a long time, but I appreciate it. Uh, hope uh, you're trying to do a podcast. Is that it? Uh, video interview. So this is going to go on YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Okay. Very, very nice. Very nice. Very good. Hope everything goes well. If you need another interview, I'm here to listen and talk. Um, Thank you for having Thank me on, you so uh, much. on one of the first of many. <laughs> Tell your brother I said hello. Yeah. All right, man. I will. Thank you again. No problem.